It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. This morning, it was revealed that this government's sweetheart deal with the private Austrian luxury spa at Ontario Place will last for 95 years. A 95-year lease, Speaker, for an enormous swath of public parkland. This government is committing land in a public park, a park owned by the people of Ontario, to a private luxury spa until 2118. This government is signing parkland away from our kids and our kids' kids and their kids' kids. Speaker, this government entered into this contract on behalf of the people of Ontario, so my question is to the Premier, when will they provide Ontarians with a copy of the contract that now involves more than a billion dollars? To respond to the government, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd love the opportunity to be able to speak about the 43 acres of public park space oh. that we will be creating at Ontario oh. Place for families to finally oh, enjoy. The government is entering into a long-term lease, but Mr. Speaker, we cannot ignore the fact that they will be providing $500 million worth of capital investment on the site, including 12 acres of land. But I will look to highlight some of the successes through the negotiations that Infrastructure Ontario has, has had with our tenants. Mr. Speaker, for the first time, we will have our tenants contributing to the repair, ongoing maintenance of the public realm space so that we don't make the same mistake that previous governments have made and leave the site into disrepair. Response. Mr. Speaker, we will have wonderful tenants that will be contributing to the annual maintenance of the site to make sure that it is clean, safe, and beautiful for families. Supplementary question. It's very interesting, Speaker, because uh, reps from the corporation called it a, I'm going to quote them, a standard multi-year commercial lease, Speaker. 95-year leases are more usual when it's public land being leased to a public institution, but this is parkland being leased to a for-profit international corporate conglomerate. It is a, if it is a standard lease, then this government should have no problem providing details to the people of Ontario. We're talking $650 million in public subsidies and a 95-year lease. Speaker, back to the Premier. What are the details of this contract? Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the member of the opposition said to herself, these are standard lease agreements. Mr. Speaker, we are not selling Unlike other waterfront destinations, we are not selling Order. the land. The, le the land will continue to be in ownership of the people of the province. This is a lease agreement. But, Mr. Speaker, our tenants will be contributing $500 million of injection to the site to bring it back to life, and they will also be contributing to annual maintenance and repair costs, which has not happened before which has led to the position that we are in today, where the site is in disrepair and in need of love and care. Mr. Speaker, our government presented a vision to the people back in 2019, and again just last week. We will have 43 acres of beautiful public realm space. Wow. We will have three wonderful tenants, which include the Science Centre, and we will have lots for families to do Response. on the site. Yeah. The final supplementary. Public realm, Speaker, this is a private luxury spa. Yeah. <laughs> Just, I, you have to ask, what are they hiding? What are they hiding, Speaker? This isn't just about Toronto. I've been traveling around the province and I've heard people from every corner of Ontario express concerns about this government's back room deals and their lack of transparency. They're alarmed by this government spending as much as $650 million on a subsidy for a private luxury spa and a massive parking lot. Now, now they're alarmed that this government is committing to a backroom 95-year lease with absolutely no details. The government this side, government come to order. Failed, failed to show Ontarians order. what value this deal has for the people of this province. They've failed to produce the contracts. They've failed to provide the business case. Speaker, Ontarians deserve to Question. know, and I'm going to go back to the Premier again. When will this government come clean about this backroom deal? 
to respond. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you. To the, member of, uh, to the member of the official opposition, Mr. Speaker, I'd love to share what I hear from constituents across this great province, including constituents in Etobicoke, Scarborough, and in Toronto. What they tell me is that they do not like the fact that this site is sitting there empty and not enjoyed by families like it was back in the 70s exactly. and 80s. Exactly. They want to bring their families there. They want to bring people that are visiting the city there, and they want it to be a place of economic development, right. a wonderful place for families. Right. Mr. Speaker, beyond the 43 acres of free public realm space, wow. we are also making sure that we have a modern marina for people to enjoy. We are making right. sure that there are boardwalks, food and beverage, piers and beaches. Mr. Speaker, this site now now, with the plans that we showed last week, we'll have something for everyone to enjoy. MVP wanted to rust. Thank you. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, here's another thing that, the, uh, that this government is trying to convince Ontarians of. They've put a lot of effort into trying to convince Ontarians that building luxury mansions on expensive sprawl is the solution to our housing crisis. They're even ordering municipalities to create more sprawl on prime farmland, and they're risking regions drinking water. But the truth is, Speaker, that no one out there is buying it. No one thinks that bulldozing species at risk or adding to municipal servicing costs and driving up property taxes is going to get a single affordable home built. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. How will lower density and more sprawl make housing more affordable to Ontarians? To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. Again, you know, the, the leader of the opposition like provides a real head-scratching argument on housing. So, so every time the government <laughs> brings forward a housing supply action plan, Good plan. we know exactly what uh, that leader and the NDP are going to do. They're going to vote against it. Sure. Then they're going to rail against that there's not Maybe. enough housing supply. Right. So, so you know, again, when they use the word sprawl. What does that mean? That means that a young person, a young couple, who want to live in the community that they grew up in, that they work in, that they want to raise their family in, can't have that opportunity. They, they also believe that, that a farm family Dream killers. want to have an opportunity to, to maybe build uh, you know, a, a site for their workers on their property. Or maybe, you know, and this is, a, this is tough for the NDP to understand, maybe sever a lot for their Response. son or daughter to live on the family farm, right? That's, That's the crux want. of what the NDP stands up against. What, what do they also stand up against, Speaker? They stand up to a $700 million investment in homelessness prevention. That's the <clears throat> Member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. Supplementary question. You know what we are going to do, Speaker? We're going to vote against legislation that compromises farmland and clean water and doesn't build a single unit of affordable housing in this province. As rents are reaching all-time highs, Speaker, and corporate landlords are turning record profits, you know who aren't affected? Those who live in cooperative housing, Speaker. Co-op residents don't have to worry about excessive rent increases because co-ops are non-profit. Co-ops are a key solution to solving the affordability crisis for low- and moderate-income households in this province, the people who are feeling the very real effects of this government's housing crisis. Yet this government's budget offers absolutely nothing to create more affordable co-op homes. Speaker, to the Premier. Will he reverse course on his failing housing plan and start investing in cooperative housing to bring some relief to Ontarians who are truly struggling? To respond, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I, I just can't for the life of me understand why this member and her party thinks that Ontarians are going to buy this load of malarkey, right? You know, we continually stand up Baloney. for homelessness prevention. We responded Baloney. directly to municipalities who asked us to invest in supportive housing. The only party 
who stands up daily in this House to speak against supportive housing is the New Democrats. Every believe, single really. time they stand up against supportive housing. Oh, they vote mean, against it? supportive housing. They vote against nonprofit housing. They vote against co-op housing. Hey, Every Florida. single hey. time we put in an initiative that builds our community housing system, Merritt Stiles and the NDP hey. say no. Stop the clock. Do I need to remind the House that we don't refer to each other by name? We refer to each other by our riding name or our ministerial title, or in this case, the Leader of the Opposition. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, they're so out of touch. Once again, this government. Order. Order. You know, I don't. I don't really care, Speaker, if they show me any respect. I just want them to respect the people of this province. that's failing to take responsibility at every turn. They do not seem to even understand history, Speaker. The last time a government made investment in co-op housing in this province, it was an NDP government. Right. We, we helped build 14,000 co-op homes. And you know what, come to order. We readied 17,000 additional homes for construction, and guess order. what? The Conservatives came in and they cancelled them all. 17,000 affordable places to live, all gone. But let's look at the here and the now. If this government still refuses to build more co-op housing, the least they could do, the least they could do is to bring back real rent control for the people of this province. Speaker, back to the Premier. People need homes they can actually afford to live in. So will he take action by supporting the NDP's motion today to bring, bring back real rent control? Members, will please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, when it comes to housing policy, the NDP styles have no merit. <laughs> Given the fact that I just asked the House to stop doing that, in the very next response, the minister did it again. I'm going to ask him to withdraw. That's like a holiday. Him to withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. <laughs> Restart the clock, and the minister can conclude his answer. Speaker, the NDP and the opposition want us to go back to a time where there was no purpose-built rental built in Ontario. So what has our policies done? They've protected tenants that are under existing rent control, just like we promised in the 2018 budget. But what's happened to new rental construction? We need more affordable rental supply. What's happened, Speaker? 2021, a 30-year high in purpose-built rental yeah, construction. Yeah. 2022, the most rental construction starts in our province's history. And in 2023, our province is staying on track with over 5,000 purpose-built rental starts already this Spons. year, which is double the last year's total, Speaker. We want to build upon that success. We don't want to go back to the failed policy yeah, yeah, yeah. that that member and her party continue to talk about. Thank you. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Nikki has lived in a rental home for two years. She pays $1,995 for a 600-square-foot basement apartment. Earlier this month, her landlord slapped her with a $200 rent increase, and now Nikki can no longer afford to pay the rent. This rent increase, this unaffordable rent increase, is allowed because this government scrapped rent control on new units. As more and more people in Ontario are struggling to pay the rent, what is this government's plan to make rent affordable now? 
to reply. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. You know, again, Speaker, I'm, I'm going to again talk about the statistics that the NDP want to roll back. 2021, 30 year high rental construction. 2022, most rental starts in the history of our province. 2023, already we've seen 5,000 rental starts, double what they were last year. Here, These are progress. the stats That's that progress. our government and here, our party here. are going to move forward. The NIMBYism Defence Party yep. are always going to stand Shame. against increasing the housing supply. Defense party. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. It is alarming to learn that Toronto's average rent price has passed the $3,000 a month barrier for the first time ever, approximately 13.8 per cent up from the previous year. This is shocking. And this massive rent spike is a clear distress signal that our housing affordability crisis is getting worse and the Conservatives' plan is not working. The NDP is bringing forward a motion this afternoon to bring in real rent control on all homes to provide immediate financial relief to Ontarians' 1.5 million renter households. My question is to the Premier. Will this government support our motion? Take your seat. To respond, the Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for her question. Speaker, it's this government that stands shoulder to shoulder with our tenants across Ontario. We're the only government that have taken decisive Order. measures to strengthen protections for renters, whilst also putting in place measures for more rental housing. We've heard about the record purpose-built rental, but I want to take us back a little bit to the dark days of the early 1990s. Speaker, when we remember when the people of Ontario entrusted the NDP for one term, to, to, uh, to run this government. They had a majority. Order. And what did they do? Let's talk about rental. The rental guideline in 1990 was 4.6%, although inflation was significantly lower. 1991, 5.4%. And in 1992, when inflation was much lower than it is today, they had it at Response? 6%, Speaker. Wow. Absolutely not acceptable. Wow. This government this year has a rent increase guideline of 2.5%. This is the government with this. The next question, the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Yay! Thank you, Speaker. Um, my question through you, sir, is to the Premier. Um, but first, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Premier, the Minister of Economic Development, the Minister of Labour, the Minister of Northern Development and Indi Indigenous Affairs for coming to St. Thomas and making a stark announcement to better Ontario. Uh, speaker, under the previous Liberal government, Ontario's auto manufacturing sector was all but destroyed because of the reckless economic policies they implemented. As far back as 2015, the CEO of Fiat Chrysler warned everyone that the short-sighted and destructive policies of the Liberals and NDP were hurting our auto industry, causing good-paying jobs to flee our province. Companies like Volvo, Jaguar, Land Rover, and Ford were raising concerns, so they opted to build assembly plants in the U.S. and Mexico instead of Windsor and Essex. True. With so much that Ontario has to offer businesses, we cannot miss opportunities Question. that will create great jobs and contribute to our province's economic prosperity. Speaker, can the Premier please explain how our government is ensuring that Ontario is an auto manufacturing leader once again? And to respond, the Premier. Speaker, I, I want to thank the great work from the MPP from uh, Elgin, Med Middlesex, and I always say one of the smartest business minds down at Queen's Park. So thank you. It took, it took about 16 ministries. It took uh, a, a big chunk of the, the province right across the board to get this deal done, to make sure that we're competitive with the rest of the world, no matter if it's our U.S. Uh, friends down south of the border, or Asia or Europe or South America. We're in a competitive market, but we made sure we rolled out the red carpet, uh, Mr. Speaker, creating 3,000 jobs. But the real amazing uh, story about this is the reciprocal, the spin-off jobs of 30 thousand extra jobs. No matter if it's an additional school or a hospital or roads or bridges or a Walmart or a Costco, these are the reciprocal jobs that are coming to St. Thomas. St. Thomas has seen some very tough times Response. when they lost 5,000 jobs. Now their towns are going to be absolutely booming. That will have spin-off jobs in London and Algon and the whole region. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Premier once again for this great historic announcement. The investments in Elgin County uh, by Volkswagen into all our local communities in southwestern Ontario truly marks a new and generational era for all of us. St. Thomas suffered through the closing of Ford's Talbotville assembly plant in 2011. It was really tough, and Sterling Truck assembly plant in 2009 resulting in thousands and thousands of jobs gone. This investment made by Volkswagen is truly historic, and it sends a clear and definitive message that we are back in business in southwestern Ontario. I want to make the point that sustainable jobs matter to the people of Ontario, and it is the leadership and actions of government that make a difference by creating the environment for business to create jobs and succeed. Speaker, can the Premier please elaborate on how our government is continuing to support our auto manufacturing sector in our great province? Premier. Well, again, I want to thank the uh, MPP. Mr. Speaker, this is historic investment of Volkswagen to build its first overseas facility. 16 million square feet. That 16 million square feet is going to be one of the largest facilities in North America, one of the largest in the entire world, because we created the environment and the conditions for them to come here, along with General Motors, Ford, Toyota, Stellantis, and Honda. There's no jurisdiction in North America that have six auto manufacturers right there producing either the batteries or producing the vehicles. Let's remind everyone, four and a half years ago, when they chased 300,000 jobs out of the province, the Liberals and NDP, they were gone. GM was closing, Ford was leaving, Stellantis was leaving. Guess what, Response. Mr. Speaker? We're an economic powerhouse. We're leading the EV revolution everywhere in the world right here in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. There's a housing development in Port Coburn, a city in my riding, that was approved in the 1980s, and they still haven't broken ground. As a matter of fact, the regional planning commissioners of Ontario, AMO, and the big city mayors have all pointed out that there are 1.25 million homes in the approval pipeline that are not being built. Planners say if the province could incentivize developers to build what is already approved, they'd be 85 per cent of the way to, to their goal. Will the minister agree to implement a reasonable time limit on developers and builders whose developments have already been approved, yes or no? Yes. To apply, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I'm glad the member opposite talked about Port Colburn. I had a great meeting with the mayor and representatives from that municipality at uh, the Ontario Good Roads meeting uh, last week. Fantastic. They're so aligned with, uh, with our government's policies on getting shovels in the ground faster. want to thank them for all of their uh, ideas and suggestions that they gave the ministry uh, during Good, Good Roads. But, you know, Speaker, I, I have to take the opportunity with this member uh, because he, he and his party continue to vote against our measures, which would incentivize uh, the development community to get shovels in the ground faster. You know, e exactly what, what our government's put forward would do what this member wants, and, and he votes against it. So I'm not sure how he rationalizes Better, that uh, back home. Choreography over there. Order. Supplementary question. Speaker, this government has been blaming municipalities in the approval process for the housing crisis. According to Amos' calculations, they've taken away $5 billion in infrastructure revenue while at the same time fining municipalities if they don't hire more planners to speed up the approval process. Meanwhile, the Premier's well-connected friends get to bank land and speculate all they want, driving up the price of housing and creating red tape. Will this minister stop blaming municipalities, do what is fair, and implement a sunset clause on approvals so that developers and builders must build housing in a reasonable period of time after they've been approved, yes or no? Thank you. Members will please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Members got it wrong. I'm blaming the NDP for voting against <laughs> yeah. every measure that this government puts forward increase housing supply. You know, this is the fundamental argument that, that we have with the NIMBYism defense party over there. Yep. You know, the fact is, we are, uh, as a government you know, have, have an idea that we, we need to get those input costs down. We need to lower the cost. Right now, 
fees and charges in the Greater Golden Horseshoe put $119,500 on the cost of the home. We want to reduce those baseline costs to make housing more affordable. The NDP will always, Speaker, and I mean this always, they're always going to stand up for more fees, more charges, more taxes on non-profit housing, co-op housing, hey. affordable housing, attainable housing. Every single time, you guys haven't seen a tax that you don't like. Response. Once again, ask the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. The next question, the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. My question is the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Job Creation, and I want to start by thanking him through you for his tireless and dogged determination for getting the Volkswagen deal across the line. Well done, sir. As we have heard many times in this House, before this government got elected, our auto and manufacturing sectors were in deep, deep trouble. Hundreds of thousands of auto and manufacturing jobs fled the province thanks to the previous government, leaving Ontario unprepared to lead the charge on the future of electric vehicles. That is why we are laser-focused on rebuilding the province's auto and manufacturing sectors by attracting investments, all the while creating good, long-term, sustainable jobs. Last Friday, our government announced further details of the historic Volkswagen investment in my riding of Elgin, Middlesex, London. Speaker, will the minister provide an update on the Volkswagen deal? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. It was a thrill to hear Volkswagen announce their $7 billion investment for their first overseas EV battery manufacturing plant right here in Ontario. From our very first meeting in Toronto a year ago this month to the four meetings they had in Queen's Park with Premier Ford, we knew that Ontario had everything VW was looking for. As we talked about our EV ecosystem, from critical minerals in the north to the manufacturing might in the south, you could see VW being drawn into the Ontario story. Clean, green electricity, coal-free, green steel. One of the largest automakers in North America, the only jurisdiction with five auto plants, 700 parts companies, 300 connected and autonomous vehicle companies, 500 tool and Spots. dye and mold makers. But what they really saw, Speaker, was that we already have the talent to turn out world-class, award-winning production. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you through you to the minister for his answer. It's remarkable, it has been remarkable, to see the hard work of this government has been paid off once again in the form of attracting the largest EV plant in the history of our province, and I dare say the largest automotive investment in the history of this country called Canada. These investments are building our strong economy and bolstering competitiveness, which is vital to our success. But beyond that, these investments demonstrate that our government continues to create good, paying, sustainable jobs now and in the future. Speaker, will the minister please elaborate on what the Volkswagen investment means not only to the people of my riding of Elgin, Middlesex, London, but to all the people of this great province. Mr. Economic Development. Speaker, what Volkswagen really saw in us was our people. They knew that we can do it here because we produce 65,000 STEM grads every year. We have 24 colleges and universities offering automotive programs. When we met them in Germany last October, we showed them Ontario understands cars and manufacturing. We have for a hundred years, and that by choosing us, they would be in the heart of the EV revolution. Speaker, we felt encouraged about where we were with the deal when Volkswagen effectively moved into our offices last January. And well, winning it, Speaker, there, there's just no better feeling than that. So thank you, Premier Ford. It was the culmination of a lot of work, a lot of shoe leather, a lot of sweat equity by a lot of partners. Speaker, Ontario now has $25 billion Spons. in new auto investment in two and a half years. The next question, the member for London West. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, a staff report went to London City Councillors last week warning that Bill 23 will cause a $100 million revenue loss over the next five years, likely resulting in property tax increases. City staff cautioned that Bill 23 will reduce parks and green spaces, limit the city's ability to invest in low-income housing, and cause needed infrastructure improvements to be deferred. It will make it challenging for London to deliver on its approved target of 47,000 new housing units. Speaker, why is this government creating a huge revenue hole for cities like London and making it more difficult to increase housing supply? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, you know, Speaker, in London, they've got a great mayor in uh, his worship, Mayor Josh Morgan. Had an awesome opportunity to chat with him on Thursday at the big city mayor's meeting in Kitchener. You know, Mayor Morgan and his council get it, right? They were one of the first municipalities in Ontario to sign on to our housing pledge. No problem in making that goal of 47,000 uh, housing starts uh, by 2031. And again, want to build, provide very respectful comments. Uh, you know, the meeting with the big city mayors on Thursday was amazing because, you know, we asked for their input. We're looking for, for their suggestions and their guidance on some of the measures in our housing policy. The only party that really sits on the sidelines are New Democrats, who always complain, uh, never give any uh, positive uh, recommendations, and again, just vote against housing policy just for the sake. We want to build upon the success that Mayor Morgan and his council have in London. We're going to continue to engage with them. Speaking. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I don't know why the minister is so dismissive of the hard-working staff who work for the City of London. The, the staff report also warns that Bill 23 will destroy wetlands, woodlands and natural habitats, resulting in serious harm and putting species, conservation and our environment at risk. The Upper Thames River Conservation Authority states that Bill 23 will open up significant holes in the delivery of our natural hazard roles, rendering them ineffective and will negatively impact the ability to protect people and property from natural hazards. Speaker, why is this government gutting protections for the wetlands that protect cities like London from flooding risk? And to respond, the Premier. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And by no means, we're actually increasing the green belt, where the green belt has grown under our administration. But let me just talk about the economic development. Order. We, Mr. Speaker, we have 445,000 people that landed in Ontario, the fastest growing region anywhere in North America. We're seeing unprecedented Order. growth. The reason we're seeing unprecedented growth, Mr. Speaker, we've created that environment and the climate for companies to invest. And every single day, my Minister of Economic Development gives me a list, three pages long, of these massive companies coming here. Guess what, Mr. Speaker? We need homes for them to live in. It's very simple economics, folks, that the NDP don't understand. It's business sense. It's called supply and demand. When there's a greater demand and not the supply, prices go up. We're going to create the supply. We're going to make sure we build the 1.5 million Order. homes for newcomers and people that are here Response. that need a home. That's what we're going to do. The next question, the member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, everyone. My question is for the Premier. We are in a housing affordability crisis in this province. We all know that. Our major urban centres have an entire generation of young people and essential workers who are unable to find rental housing that they can afford. Enter 8 Dawes Road, a plot of land in the centre of my beautiful riding of Beaches East York, originally a site owned by Metrolinx. It was recently sold to a housing developer. Great! More housing just steps from the Danforth Go train station and TTC subway at Maine exactly where new apartment buildings should be encouraged. And yet, that Metrolinx land deal contained zero requirements for delivering any on-site affordable housing units. My question is, why doesn't this government require that Metrolinx include minimum affordable housing requirements in their property sales question. to private housing developers? And why wasn't this done for the Danforth Go station site at 8 Dawes Road? To reply, Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. 
I appreciate the member's question very much because it was this government that led the way in terms of tying housing with transit construction. We are expanding the subway system by 50 percent in the City of Toronto and York Region, and we want to bring housing opportunities with it, which led to the creation of the Transit-Oriented Communities Program, which we are now very much focusing on the transit stations at Ontario Line, Young North. We will be providing housing opportunities, but also affordable, attainable housing models as well. And we are working with local communities to learn from them what other community benefit, what other community needs exist within that particular Fantastic. area. We are working very well with the City of Fantastic. Toronto. We are progressing on all of our stations, and we will continue to work in partnership with Metro. Thank you very much for that answer, but obviously 8 Dawes Road fell through the cracks because nothing happened there. And in front of me now, I have the report for the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force. The task force is comprised of industry leaders and experts. They consulted with stakeholders, including municipalities and advocacy groups, to develop the report. In Appendix C, Government Surplus Land, the following point is made. All future government land sales, whether commercial or residential, should have an affordable housing component of at least 20 per cent in your own report. My question to the Premier is, what is the point? What is the point of creating reports if you do not take the sound advice of experts and will take a bolder and gutsier approach to affordable housing by requiring 20 per cent of newly built units to be affordable? And if you need a backbone, I'm happy to give you an injection. Question. Order. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to ask the member opposite, who sat on city, city Council for many years, why the city didn't lead the way in building a TOC program. It was this government that led the way in terms of tying housing to transit development opportunities across the City of Toronto and Young North. And, Mr. Speaker, we are making great progress. We are building more housing, including attainable and affordable housing opportunities along our subway line, but we're not stopping there. Mr. Speaker, we are doing a very thorough analysis of all of our GO stations within the greater Toronto-Hamilton area to see where other opportunities exist. We announced East Harbour, for example, as well as Mimico. Mimico actually was a station that the former previous government spoke about but never got done. Mr. Speaker, this is a government of action, and we will build housing and community benefits that come along with it. Order. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. Many communities across our province have too many individuals and families experiencing housing instability. The factors contributing to homelessness and poverty are complex and need to be addressed with comprehensive, innovative, long-term strategies that help our most vulnerable. In my riding of Brantford Brant, we have a number of incredible resources and supports for those who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. I am incredibly proud of the work that these agencies undertake to deliver in providing help for individuals, families, and Indigenous communities, but there is more that should be done and can be done for them. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government's investments into local programs will support housing and homelessness prevention services in my community of Brantford Brant? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Brantford Brant for the tireless work that he does and for this important question. Our government is committed to providing the resources they need to combat homelessness and poverty. We are investing an additional $1.8 million into that community, bringing the total amount of provincial funding to almost $7 million, an early 34 per cent increase. Speaker. And this money will be used to fund the Homelessness Prevention Program and the Indigenous Supportive Housing Program, which will provide substantial support to those who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Our government recognizes the critical relationship between housing supply and homelessness, and that's why we're working to ensure that all Ontarians have access to affordable housing and safe housing, no matter where they live. 
We are working with Response. the 29 largest and fastest growing municipalities to increase housing density around major transit stations, areas and priority growth areas like the downtown. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The shortage of housing supply impacts all of Ontarians, no matter their background or their budget. Under the previous Liberal government, the shortage of affordable housing worsened and community supports were lacking. Communities like my riding were unfortunately overlooked by the previous Liberal government, and my constituents are rightly concerned about the impact that their inactions have had on this serious situation. Ontarians deserve a government that is focused on tackling the supply crisis and providing a comprehensive approach to increase the supply of supportive and affordable housing for the most vulnerable. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is continuing to make progress in supporting communities to ensure that resources are available for those who need it most? Thank you. Housing. Thank you once again to the passionate member from Brantford Brant for the question. We're working hard to ensure that all residents have access to the resources they need, and we're committed to providing municipalities with the tools that they require to do so. Speaker, since being appointed Associate Minister, I've been meeting people in many communities, talking to our great members from this caucus, from all of these regions, and the consensus is clear. Unlike the previous Liberal government who neglected communities like Brantford Brant, we recognize that every community in Ontario deserves the same opportunity to grow and to prosper. Speaker, under the leadership of this Premier and this Minister, our government is investing billions of dollars into transit and infrastructure as we accelerate the construction of new homes in all parts of the province. And Speaker, Response. we're going to get it done. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa West, Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. Since coming to power, this government has cut education funding in Ontario by $1,200 per student in real terms. And thanks to this underfunding, school boards are currently scrambling to plan cuts. Teachers and education workers are burning out, and a growing number of classrooms have unqualified educators present. Kids are going without vital supports. In the midst of this crisis, the Premier thinks that increasing funding for education by only 0.8 per cent is sufficient when the government's own projection for inflation this year is 3.6 per cent. Why does the Premier believe developers and highways should get billions, but kids should get cuts? Minister of Education. On the contrary, we believe students should get back to basics, which is why we brought forth a plan to strengthen foundational skills in reading, writing, and math. Mr. Speaker, we increased staffing by 2,000 additional focused educators with, with respect to literacy, promotion, and math. We hired 8,000 additional workers since we started in 2018. This year, like every year, we're increasing funding over $690 million, an increase of you know, funding that's going to help kids get back on track. This morning, we announced over $20 million additional funds to combat violence that's happening in and around our schools, a 37 per cent increase in focus on youth to help school boards with respect to after-school mentorship, leadership and career development programming, and free camps for high-need communities. We just launched an agreement with the Pinball Clemens Foundation. Um, we launched another agreement with Respect Group, that's Sheldon Kennedy, former NHL player, all of which these Response. funds are for TDSB and school boards across Ontario to combat violence and keep children safe in schools across this province. Perhaps the minister can get one of his new math coaches to teach him about inflation. It's really going to blow his mind. <laughs> Speaker, the crisis in education is creating a downward spiral where impossible working conditions are burning out teachers and education workers who are leaving the profession, making the working conditions even worse for those who remain. We now have 40,000 teachers in Ontario who are registered with the college but not teaching in one of our schools. Meanwhile, the number of unqualified teachers in classrooms is growing. How does the Premier think this is going to help kids catch up? Mr. Of Education. Mr. Speaker, we brought forth legislation to accelerate the approval and certification of new educators in Ontario. Unfortunately, members opposite have confirmed that they will oppose legislation to improve 
schools and better focus them on student achievement in Ontario classrooms. Mr. Speaker, we've also hired 8,000 more staff opposed by the NDP. We just announced a $560 million increase in funding opposed by the NDP. We increased 2,000 frontline educators just last Sunday. That too is opposed by the NDP. The constant in this legislature is opposition by the NDP no, no, for no. progress, for change, and desperately needed reform to improve publicly funded schools. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Oh, great minister. My constituents of Newmarket Aurora, as well as many individuals and families across our province, hold a deep affection for Ontario's provincial parks. Despite the challenges of the past few years, Ontario parks have remained a cherished destination for Ontarians seeking to escape and unwind, surrounded by the natural beauty of our great province. Visitation rates to Ontario parks have reached unprecedented levels, and this trend shows no sign of slowing. Unfortunately, for those living in more urban areas, it can be challenging for individuals and families to access these parks for much needed day in nature. Speaker, what measures is our government taking to expand recreational opportunities for all Ontarians? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the question from, uh, from the member opposite, and I appreciate her advocacy for increased recreational opportunities for Ontarians. Speaker, I was proud to stand on Earth Day alongside the MPP for Pickering Uxbridge, who's been a strong champion for the outdoors and the environment, to announce, to announce Ontario's first ever urban provincial park, Speaker. This is also the first provincial park the province of Ontario is announcing in over 40 years. Wow. Ontarians in the GTHA, Speaker, we know don't always have access, equal access to Ontario's green spaces, unlike those living in other areas of the province. That's why our government is working hard to bring more opportunities for all Ontarians Lots. to enjoy the great outdoor. As the trail capital of Ontario, Uxbridge is an ideal location, Speaker, and I thank the many partners who I'll elaborate on in the supplementary who joined us. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. And thank you to the minister for that great answer and for your work because I was so excited to see that on Saturday. The creation of the first urban provincial park in Uxbridge is a monumental achievement, particularly for those residing in the Greater Toronto Area. With more and more individuals and families attending our provincial parks, it is necessary that our government respond and expand opportunities for access. Not only do Ontario parks serve a vital role in supporting scientific research and protecting our province's biodiversity, they also provide recreational activities, tourism, and so much more. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on plans for Question. this proposed park and how it will benefit Ontario? Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again uh, to the member for that question. It's a yet another example of how we're building a stronger Ontario. And I want to thank all the partners who joined us on Earth Day for that announcement, who we've been working for years with uh, to make yet, uh, Saturday possible. You know, I'd like to thank Mayor Barton, first and foremost, from uh, the town of Oxbridge. He's Good been Mayor. a champion working alongside our member. I'd like to thank Regional Chair John Henry. I'd like to thank John McKenzie from the TRCA, Rob Baldwin from the Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority, uh, the Chair of our Protected Areas Working Group, Peter Kendall, who was there, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, Shad Foundation, Earth wow. Rangers, local high school yeah. students who were there. Speaker, this is what partnership looks like. And in closing, a special thank you to John McKenzie. Yeah. Yeah. You know, John, uh, whose legacy land donation helped make this possible. Speaker, it's important to note that legacy landowners like John 
we've enabled them to protect these areas for generations to come thanks to the Greenlands Conservation Partner Program, which this minister increased for a historic $14 million in funding in the budget. Fonts. It's one of the reasons we've protected four times that of the previous government uh, since the last election, Speaker, and we're going to continue protecting these crown jewels for generations to come. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. A constituent named Kathy contacted my office after she was placed in a stock closet while receiving cancer treatment at a hospital in Hamilton. Before this, she was in the hallway awaiting discharge, which didn't happen. Kathy does not blame the staff because she knows they have no choice. She is upset because this has become a solution in Ontario under this government. Speaker, why does the Premier find it acceptable to funnel money into the private sector while our public health care system is under such strain that cancer patients are being treated in closets? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. I, I hope the member opposite shared with Kathy the 50-plus investments that we are making That's through true. the Infrastructure Ontario Ministry to either build, expand, or renovate 50 different hospital builds, including in Niagara Region. You know, we talk about the need for ensuring that healthcare services are available in community. How do we do that, Speaker? We make sure that we have facilities that are exceptional so that the services continue to be provided, and we make investments on the health human resources side, which, of course, we are also doing with historic investments, working with the Minister of Colleges and University, the largest increase in nursing students and health human resources historically in Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. Back to the Premier. This Premier promised to end hallway medicine right. in 2018, right. but we're in 2023 and the crisis in our hospital has gone from bad to worse. Yep. Kathy told me she received decent care, but the ward was extremely busy and staff told her they needed the bed. She was spent more than 24 hours in a makeshift bed, which she said was dark, unsanitary and had no call bell. This is not normal, and it is bizarre to watch this government applaud themselves while our health care system crumbles. The solution isn't complicated, Speaker. Will this government prioritize funding of our public health care system, or will they continue to divert public dollars into personal profits? Mr. Health. We have and we will continue to with the investments of over 50 different capital builds, including in the member's own riding in uh, the Hamilton redevelopment of the Hamilton Health Sciences Corporation. That is in planning now. You know, these investments are going to make sure that for generations to come, we have hospital facilities that are available, that are completely state-of-the-art because we have incredible health care staff who have incredible um, opportunities to serve the people of their communities, and now we're making the investments on the capital side. Over 50 new investments. And the next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Red Tape Reduction. Businesses across Ontario, including those in my community, are not immune to the effects of ongoing supply chain disruptions, inflation and increased interest rates. Because these global challenges have local impacts, our government must continue to take bold action to help support our businesses during this period of uncertainty. That means eliminating overregulation that imposes red tape barriers and burdens. Taking action to reduce red tape supports our small businesses through direct cost savings, which in turn fuels job creation and growth. Speaker, can the minister please explain what sure. actions our government is taking to help businesses remain competitive? Minister for Red Tape Production. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague, uh, the member from Newmarket, Aurora, and for hard work on behalf of her constituents. Mr. Speaker, I don't think I need to remind Ontarians about the disastrous legacy of the previous Liberal government supported by the NDP, of course, that helped drive over 300,000 jobs out of the provinces and businesses were leaving. Mr. Speaker, thankfully to the efforts of this government, Mr. Speaker, we are changing all of that. It's our efforts through 10 different pieces of legislation, Mr. Speaker. We have helped reduce the, the cost for businesses to do business in annually about $700 million, wow. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's uh, no secret why over 85,000 new businesses were registered in the province of Ontario last year alone, Mr. Speaker. Businesses are taking notice right around the world. They are making the investments in Fonts. our province. We are creating the conditions for them to thrive, which ultimately helps our province thrive and every single resident in the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for visiting my riding of Newmarket Aurora this past Friday, where we had a very fruitful roundtable. And during this recent visit with our local small business leaders, the Minister of Red Tape Reduction and I heard about the problems that they are facing because of outdated, redundant, and ineffective regulations. Their message to our government was very clear. Businesses expect our government to leave no stone unturned when it comes to cutting red tape and attracting new investments that will help to create more good-paying jobs and strengthen our economy. While our government continues to get it done, it is obvious that continuing to eliminate red tape and keeping costs low is crucial to maintaining Ontario's competitive advantage. Question. Speaker, can the minister please share how our government is making it easier for businesses to invest and grow in Ontario? Minister of Red Tape Production. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my honourable colleague for that important question once again, and I want to thank her for organizing a wonderful roundtable with her local businesses uh, last Friday and had an opportunity to hear firsthand about some of the challenges and feedback in terms of how we can continue to make our province competitive, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy in my role as the minister responsible for red tape reduction is meeting with businesses, meeting with individuals, and hearing firsthand about the challenges that they're facing and how our government can continue to help them help their business be competitive around the province, Mr. Speaker. And it's part of the reason, and that's how we uh, have informed our 10 different pieces of legislation that we have introduced to help the regulatory burden on Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. We recognize there's a lot more Response. work to do, and we will continue to work hard each and every day, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that every Ontarian, every single business in the province has the opportunity to succeed and compete. Thank Great you, answer. Mr. Speaker. Great answer. Question the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Health Minister. As our provincial health care system continues to face severe staffing shortages and patients are seeing record wait time, whether in emergency room or for surgery, yet more than a dozen nurses are being laid off at Stevenson Memorial Hospital. Can the Minister of Health explain what led this hospital to have to lay off 13 nurses? The Minister of Health. So I'm going to put a couple of facts on the table before I answer that question in particular. First of all, in Canada, Ontario has the lowest wait times for surgeries. We lead Canada in Ontario. That is in no small part because of the excellent work that our clinicians and our hospitals have been able to do dealing with the pandemic backlog. We've done that. We also understand that there is more work to do in terms of ensuring that we even do better for the people of Ontario, which is why through Bill 60, we have allowed an expansion in the community and surgical area. And the member opposite would know very well that there are hundreds of community surgical and diagnostic um, organizations that Response. are already operating, uh, operating in the province of Ontario, and we are expanding that 
in Bill 60 because we understand that people want access to care as close to their community That's as right. possible. That's right. The supplementary question. While most healthcare settings are desperate to hire nurses, Stevenson Memorial Hospital is laying off nurses because they are facing a deficit, because the government does not fund them enough. We all know where those nurses will end up. They'll end up working for big for-profit corporations who will be receiving hundreds of millions of dollars from this Conservative government, directing money away from public health care to private for-profit. Will this government allocate the funds to Stevenson Memorial Hospital so it can keep their nurses that the patients so need and deserve? The Minister of Health. So, you know, we've spoken many times about our government launching the largest health human resource recruiting and training initiatives in Ontario's history. Some of that, of course, is embedded in Bill 60 with an as-of-right proposal that will ensure that if you are a practicing clinician, doctor, nurse in other Canadian jurisdictions, you will be able to immediately come to Ontario and start practicing without having to wait. It is truly an opportunity for people who wish to move their family or are already here in Ontario, that opportunity to start work immediately. We, of course, also have, through the work of the Minister of Colleges and University, our Learn and Stay program, which has ensured the largest number of students applying for those uh, nursing spots because they want the opportunity to train, to live, to work in their community. That recruitment Bonds. continues, and we will ensure that we train the um, appropriate health human resources. We're doing the capital investments. We're getting it done. Thank you. Next question. The member for Brampton North. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, my question is for the President of the Treasury Board uh, and uh, Emergency Management. I I want to talk a little bit about a community he knows well, the community of Brampton, Ontario. Now, we know that Brampton is a community that is simply tired of waiting. We're tired of waiting, whether it's in the hospital waiting room after 15 years of neglect where they closed hospitals under the previous Liberal government. We're tired of waiting in traffic where progressive politicians have continually voted against bypass highways for our city in favour of downtown Toronto environmental interests. But, Speaker, when this government got elected, the uh, residents of Brampton have a reason to wait no longer. We have help on the way. Can the President of the Treasury Board please tell the residents what we're doing to get it done for Brampton families? Reply, President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the member for Brampton North for all of his great work and advocacy for the city of Brampton. Fantastic. Mr. Speaker, let's look at this government's uh, record under the leadership of Premier Ford for the city of Brampton. The members opposite voted for uh, against uh, a new hospital for the city, the second, the largest health care investment that the city of Brampton Shame. will be getting. Shame. The, the members opposite voted against two medical school, uh, a new medical school for the city Shame. of Brampton. Shame. The members opposite uh, uh, voted against uh, a, a new highway, the Highway 413, that will be uh, made for the residents uh, of the city of Brampton and for the Peel region, uh, Mr. Speaker. Every step of the way, this government has brought significant investments to the people of uh, Brampton, to the city of Brampton. Uh, we've brought billions of dollars in economic development, uh, a new Stellantis plant that is going to be built in Brampton. Wow. The members opposite wow. voted against that. We will continue, wow. Mr. Speaker, to build Brampton into the great city it is, and we're uh, truly grateful to have new members from the member of Brampton hey, hey. North. Thank you very much. Pleased to inform the House that we have a special guest with us in the chamber.